open to you. Let me read you an excerpt from his chapel sermon. Heaven has provided this country, not indeed derelict, but only partially settled, and consequently open for the reception of a new enlargement of JPEF. What about that? Europe was settled by JPEF. You understand what I just told you? 200 years ago, that's what Christians believed in this country, before political correctness got everybody locked jawed out. And perhaps this, uh, oh, uh, Europe was settled by JPEF. America is settling from Europe. And perhaps this second enlargement bids fair to surpass the first. You want to see a prophecy this guy made two centuries ago? Listen to this one. In two or three hundred years, this second enlargement may cover America with a population uh, of 300 million. What about that? The United States may be 200 million souls, whites. Can we contemplate their present? Now listen to this statement. Can we contemplate their present and anticipate their future increase and not be struck with astonishment to find ourselves in the midst of the fulfillment of the prophecy of Noah? Here we are, 21st century Christians, scared of our own stinking shadows. No clue what the Bible really teaches in most places. I know how your pastor was trained, and I know what you've been taught, so I'm not reading you any kind of riot act or trying to educate you. I know you know this stuff. I want to just reinforce it to you. People, because it's a Bible issue. Listen to this quote. May we not see that we are the object which the Holy Ghost had in view 4,000 years ago? when he inspired the venerable patriarch with the visions respecting his posterity? What a question. You see the two different Yale professors? One believed the Bible and one's a headgate with no, no interest in the Word of God. So he's, he's out the lunch. But the Christians have never been questioning for centuries how that happened. The Bible said it was going to happen. And, and, the, the, and it's here now. And we said again, who knows who wasn't here during Sunday school uh, yesterday, with all the different things going on here, but we said the main purpose that God was going to enlarge Japheth, he's going to pick one boy out of Noah's three sons and do something with him that he wasn't going to do with the other two. He was going to enlarge him in order to one day get the gospel around to the world. That's why he's called the elder brother. That's what big brothers do. They look out for their little brothers. And he got the gospel to the African people. He got the gospel to the Asian world. And he got it really all around the world. That's why America, and used to be Great Britain, America, foremost missionary uh, nation in the world. We, all, we, we know that, but we don't make the connection. How did it happen? Uh, happened exactly how God said it was going to happen. And you know, preacher, I was uh, saved forever before I even learned uh, what the word Japheth means. I looked it up. It means beautiful. Exactly like Romans 10, 15 says, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace. We talked about Sunday school, the sun never sets on the British Empire because God enlarged England so far out. And you'll see England in Genesis 10.1 in the Table of Nations chapter when God deals with all three boys and their descendants, tells them which way they went. First one is going, Japheth had seven boys, seven, son, seven, seven brides for seven boys, whatever that crazy thing was. The first boy is Gomer and he populates the British Isles. That's in a Schofield note over 100 years ago. Did you know, by the way, that C.I. Schofield survived 18 major Civil War battles, including Antietam, the bloodiest day in the whole history of this country, and one day's combat fatalities? He, he kept him alive through 18 battles and, and got him all, hooked off of alcoholism and got him saved so you could have a Schofield Bible and learn some of this stuff from over 100 years ago. So this is not some news thing. The new thing is Christians diving under their stinking beds, whether it's COVID or, or the race card and are scared of their own shadows. And that, that does not honor God. I'm telling you, neighbor, it doesn't honor him. All right, now, let me uh, now show you something really fun. This is going to blow your minds. Turn to Ezekiel 26. I'm telling you, neighbor, uh, I am, uh, I'm, I'm working on my new book. I'm in chapter 4. 
of my new work. Uh, the book's called Perilous Times. By the way, I didn't say one thing about my books tonight. Whatever you do, please get as many of them as you can get out of here. You'll learn so much stuff. I've made up a lot of stuff in there. You'll never know what's real and not real, but it'll blow your mind. It'll, it'll educate you. Listen, I got, a, I got a letter from Judge Roy Moore in Alabama thanking me for what if God wrought. One of, one of his neighbors heard me preach one time and got the book to him. I got a letter from Jesse Helms a year before he died. He was reading it during Christmas break, praising my, my name. I mean, you know, just excited as he can be. Uh, what the, I, had, I went to, you know, uh, you know uh, um, uh, what's his name over there in Hicksville, Long Island, uh, the Ruckman guy over there. I'll think of it in a minute. I preached for him years ago. One of his church members came up to me, said, I was just at a book signing with Sean Hannity. And one of his book signings, uh, and I gave him a copy of What Hath God Wrought. I don't know if he ever read one page, but these books cost me thousands and thousands of dollars to make them look right. Largest printer in the world printed all my books so far. The old R.R. Donnelly Company. You old timers know about them. They busted their company up recently. Uh, it's LLC Communications now. Hey, I was just preaching in, te in Texas the other day. A, ruck a real good Ruckman guy down there uh, running a Bible college there in uh, Austin. He told me, I just got back from Israel, and, and Colonel Oliver North was leading the Holy Land tour I was on. I gave him my copy of Holy Ground, and he about flipped out. I've got all his Iran-Contra stuff in that book. I mean, it's quirky. I mean, God knows how to connect the dots, but the, fo the, 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 the folks that bomb out half the time are the Christian. Duh, you know. So try, you know, am, try, to, try to get some of this stuff so you'll learn. I want to be a blessing to you. It only took me 16 years of my life to write those five books, but there's so much stuff in there. And I'll give you an example. Right now, today I'm working on the Battle of Guacamole. That's the chapter number four, and I, it, it starts here in Ezekiel 26. What does that got to do with anything? What did God say he was going to do? He said he, was, he would enlarge Japheth. You know, it didn't happen overnight, neighbor. So uh, uh, anybody ever you remember the pyramids with the pharaohs? All right, where were the pyramids at? Watch, Asia, Africa, or Europe? <laughs> oh, don't go back to being Montreal on me, come on. Were you talking about race again? I've got to tighten up. You know we tighten up when you talk about race. Tighten up, Archie Bell and the drugs. Relax, Adrian. Talk to me now or we'll be here all night. I, I, sh I finish quick when I get in in inspiration from the pew, amen. Where are the pyramids at? Asia, Africa, or Europe, help me. Thank you. That's Ham. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. We're looking for your crazy relative, Sh Japheth, right? All right. How about, um, how about uh, uh, the, the uh, 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 um, Sennacherib coming down from Assyria and taking the ten northern tribes and scattering them all over the place, right? Where in the world was he at? That's up in near Assyria, right? Is that Africa, Asia, or, or Europe? <laughs> You're the smartest people I've ever preached to. <laughs> I'm telling you, neighbor. What's that, Lord? They need another Italian joke. You know how an Italian normally gets into a good business? Through the air shaft. All right, stay with me. We'll be over pretty soon. Okay. Uh, so you got the idea? I, there's no Europe there yet. You want to see where Japheth gets enlarged for the first time? This is going to blow your mind. Look at Ezekiel 26. When you get to Ezekiel 26... You have the prophet Ezekiel is in captivity. He's in Babylon. And, then, and Nebuchadnezzar's in charge of the world. Where's Babylon at, you know? Well, duh, we've only been in Iraq for 50,000 years. I know you know where that is, right? Okay, now God is going to pronounce judgment on Tyre. That's a, a city due north of Israel, right on the coastline. And uh, that's in Lebanon. Remember during Solomon's time? King Hiram was friends with Solomon, sent all the cedars of Lebanon to him. But now it's uh, 400 years later, 500 years almost, and the, and the folks in, uh, in Lebanon and Tyre is their key city. Uh, they hate the Jews. Nebuchadnezzar has just come down and cleaned the clocks of half, the, half, the, half of Israel and taken Ezekiel away. And in five, a few more years later, he's going to come down there for, uh, and uh, four years later and wipe out you know, Jerusalem, burn it to the ground. It was two major, two major invasions of uh, Jerusalem. Well, the first one's behind them already. And, and the, and the, uh, tyrant, uh, the tyr, uh, Tyranese people are excited. And God's hearing them and he's mad about it. Watch over here. Verse number two, son of man. Verse 1, And it came to pass in the eleventh year, in the first day of the month, 
that the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, because that Tyrus hath said against Jerusalem, Ah, isn't that funny just the way they put it in 1611? A-H-A. You know what that means? Ha! They're thumbing their nose at the Jews. They're, they're rejoicing. Ah, she is broken. That was the gates of the people. She is turned unto me. I shall be replenished. Now she is laid waste. So Tyre is getting excited that the Jews are getting their, you know, come up. It's that old Yiddish term, right? Now look at here. But see, the problem was God was listening. Amen. And he said, I'm going to spank my people, not you. Verse 3. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Tyrus, and will cause many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causeth his waves to come up. Okay, now, what he's going to do is, he has Nebuchadnezzar single out Nebuchadnezzar as his hammer. You know, six different times he called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. You all know that. Do uh, you know Nebuchadnezzar wrote uh, the entire fourth chapter of the book of Daniel? You think you might run into Nebuchadnezzar when you get to heaven as an Old Testament era Gentile that maybe got in? I don't know. He said he extolled the God of Israel. You know, it's funny. If he goes, if, if, if a preacher, if Nebuchadnezzar went to the other place, he'll be the only author of the Word of God burning in fire for eternity. You say you, say you never thought about that? I, I understand. Look down here at verse 7. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I will bring upon Tyrus Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Watch verse 8. He shall slay with the sword. Verse 9. He shall set engines of war against thy walls and with his axes. Verse 10. By reason of the abundance of his horses, their dust shall cover thy walls. Blah, blah, blah. Verse 11. With the hoofs of his horses shall he tread down all thy streets. He shall slay thy people by the sword, and thy strong garrison shall go to the ground. Ten singular personal pronouns in those verses, all directed to Nebuchadnezzar coming down against Tyre. Okay, now he comes down there in 586 B.C., the same year his army sweep into Jerusalem for the second time. And you know what he does? He cleans their clocks. Now don't miss this now. Right on, you know how the map of Israel, you know how it is, Sea of Galilee up here, Jordan River, Dead Sea, Israeli, Israeli coastline, right? Over here, the Mediterranean, right? Due north of Israel, you go into Lebanon, right? Syria's off here at about uh, 2 o'clock, right? You go, keep going straight north. You go into, um, you know, you go into, uh, uh, you know, Lebanon up here. And right on the coastline is... Uh, the city Tyre. Sometimes in the Bible it's called Tyre, sometimes it's T-Y-R-E. That's the target there. And Nebuchadnezzar comes over there and wipes the whole place out. Just like that, right? Okay? Uh, prophecy fulfilled, right? Mission accomplished and prophecy fulfilled, right? How many, how many of you like me, but you really don't trust me like you, you know better not to trust me? You can feel I'm setting you up every five minutes, yes? I don't trust myself, say amen. Hey, uh, you know why Italians can't count to 10? Because, is my Italian friend here tonight? Where's that dude at? Yeah, he's a half Italian. I told the preacher today he's half Italian. You know why Italians can't count to 10? Because every time they get to two, they run into a tree. Hey, hey amen, Brother Grady. Okay. All right, you're fading out tonight. It's Monday night. All right, you want some Polak jokes? I'll still tell you the first Polak joke I've ever heard. It was from a Catholic priest in my Catholic high school, Father Drupieski, amen, about 500 pound Catholic priest. He said, you hear about the Polak who thought Johnny Cash was a pay toilet? That's 1967, I heard it in chemistry class. Say amen right there. What do you want? You want Jewish jokes? What kind of jokes you want? Shoot, I got Helen Keller jokes. I, you know how Helen Keller's, mo <laughs> Helen Keller's mother used to punish her? You rearrange her furniture, amen. Hey, <laughs> how much time you got? All right, whatever it takes to hold the crowd. That's the, that's the deal in the 21st century up here. Okay, blah, blah, blah. Mission accomplished? Yes. Prophecy fulfilled? Yet yeah, no. Well, yeah, no, yes and no. 
See, I went through Bible college five years, school that wouldn't spit on the King James Bible, Jack Howell's college. They meant well, but they were dumb. The teachers, you know, made fun of the King James position. And I, a long story short. And I spent five years going to prepare for the ministry, and not one teacher ever stood up in the classroom and told us they were too tired. There's one on the mainland known as Old Tire. But they had a second tire, watch this, a mile offshore on a 40-acre island with 150-foot high walls facing the sea, facing the mainland. And that was the Alamo for all the upper crust Tyrians when the pressure was going to get on. They'd take the money out there and all the wealthy people and the key soldiers and all, most of the folks, they'd send the women and kids elsewhere, someplace else when an army was coming, and they would skip out of there and get into their Alamo and nobody could mess with them because they had a big Phoenician navy as well that would get behind them too far away for catapults and nobody could do anything about it. Nebuchadnezzar started trying to figure out how to get to them he spent 13 years, and he gave up. You'll never believe what, he, he didn't get a nickel out of the deal. You want to see one of the funniest verses in the Bible? Turn over to uh, blah, blah, blah. Turn over to Ezekiel 29. <laughs> this is beyond funny. You want to, <laughs> not only did Nebuchadnezzar not get anything, but he and his army lost something in the process. They were after this mess for so long, preacher, that many of his own soldiers aged in the process. <laughs> Look at verse 18, chapter 29. Son, son of man, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, caused his army to serve a great service against Tyrus. Every head was made bald. How <laughs> you like that, neighbor? Jack Howes used to say, if you're bald in the front, you're a thinker. If you're bald in the back, you're a lover. And if you're bald all over, you think you're a lover. That's Jack Howes' old joke. Every head was made bald, and every shoulder was peeled. Yet had he no wages, nor his army, for Tyrus, for the service that he had served against it. So he blew 13 years of his life with his men. They had to wind up settling for a consolation prize, humiliating, you know, uh, non-aggression or peace treaty. And then that was the end of that. So, was the prophecy fulfilled? And you know something? When that happened, all kind of folks jumped on the Bible, you know? Secular folks said, ah, the Bible's not true. But they weren't nearly as bad preacher as the liberal, uh, you know, theologians and the... Uh, worse than uh, uh, left-wing neo-evangelicals, the folks that want to fight inspiration, they jumped all out over that as a failed prophecy. But what they didn't pay attention to was the text. Go back to Ezekiel 26. Ezekiel 26. Look over here at verse number 3. We, we read right over it quick. I didn't, I didn't comment on it. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the old Tyrus, and will cause, what's the next two words? Many nations to come up against thee, as the sea causes his waves to come up. You all see that inspired metaphor the Holy Ghost used? How many of you realize, you know, what erosion means? Doesn't happen overnight, does it? You know who Nebuchadnezzar was? He was the first wave that hit that place. But there would be a lot more where that came from. Matter of fact, the last one was an 18-something. It was a monstrous earthquake at the, at the place. Now, I'm, I'm coming somewhere. I'm coming somewhere. You know what takes place about 240 years later? One of those next waves shows up. It's an upstart 22-year-old kid. He comes roaring in there with an army. Everybody runs to the Alamo again. He looks over everything. You might have heard of him. His name was Alexander the Great. And they're thumbing their nose at everybody from their, from their 150-foot-high walls, you know, on a little island. <laughs> 
But see, he's not Nebuchadnezzar. He's not, he's not dumb. He's, he's got some sharp Greek engineers. And you know what they did? They told him, I said, you got a, he said, you got a natural sand berm out here in the water, about two and a half yards deep under the surface of the water. That's it. You know what they did? They spent seven months scraping old Babylon. The mainland was called, uh, not Babylon, the mainland was called Old Tyre. The rock fortress on the ocean was called New Tyre. 200 years later, preacher, like an archaeological tell, what was left of Old Tyre is still there. Timber, lumber, I mean, uh, stone, everything that had been the main city when Nebuchadnezzar leveled it, his engineers scraped it like a rock. Do you see that verse there? Is it verse 5 or 6? I want to know who told all this to Ezekiel. What's it say in verse 4? And they shall destroy the walls of Tyrus and break down her towers. I will, also, I will also scrape her dust from her and make her like what? Top of a rock. And you know what he does? They throw all that stuff into the Mediterranean and they build a mole, an artificial causeway, a mile out to that island. Watch my lips. 200 feet wide. And when they first started that mess, the Tyranines up on the Palisades are looking at it and they're, they're laughing their heads off. Look at this crazy spectacle down there. Hey, guess what? They stopped laughing, preacher, about five, six months later. Remember the Twin Towers in Manhattan? Well, they're up on the walls looking. Here comes Twin Towers. Siege towers, 165 feet high, 15 feet higher than their walls up there. And here they come, rumbling across that 200 foot wide causeway. Rawhide all over them so they couldn't shoot them down with, wood, with fiery arrows. And they stopped laughing real quick. And when they got up there, it was all over but to shout. And Alexander was mad for making them mess around. They killed, I don't know, 8,000 of the enemy soldiers in the fight, lost 400 men of their own, killed 8,000. Slaughtered, I think, 12,000, 15,000 civilians. Sold 30,000 or so into slavery. And then just for, you know, cherry on top, they took 2,000 surviving enemy soldiers from the battle and crucified them on the, ocean, on the shore, you know, beach blanket bingo, you know what I'm saying? That's Alexander the Great. You want to see an amazing scripture? I, 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 in the worst way, I want the youngest kids in the building, you know, to, to, to always be in awe of that book. Crazy Facebook and phones and every electronic gizmo is stealing away the hearts of our children all across this country. I mean, like I see it all the time. You know what all the time means in the Greek? I'm everywhere. I know evangelists that pass offering plates before they preach have the kids put their phones in the plate before they'll preach in the service. You're spoiled here preaching a nice way. These kids are really nice. Want to see an amazing verse? See all those he's? We started at verse 7. He, he, he. Remember that? Pointing to Nebuchadnezzar. Would you like to see verse 12? The he stop at verse 12 because you're going to jump 240 years from verse 11 to verse 12. And they, see that they? Now we're dealing with Alexander the Great. And they shall make a spoil of thy riches. Nebuchadnezzar didn't get a nickel, did he? And make a prey of thy merchandise, colon. And they shall break down thy walls and destroy thy pleasant houses. Watch this, neighbor. Would you look at the last part of that verse? And don't pass out on me. And they shall lay thy stones and thy timber and thy dust. Where? Where? There it is. Who told that to Ezekiel 240 years before it happened? Don't tell me about your dopey smartphones. And I know you're different. I'm used to being in bad churches. <laughs> How you like that, neighbor? You want to see something really funny? So God spanks Tyre big time. You want to really see something incredible? Turn to Isaiah chapter 23. Isaiah 23. 
Now, Tyre was such a beautiful city in its heyday there that it actually is a type, the king of Tyre and his, and his, and his beautiful city is a picture of the devil in the very next chapter. Remember that? In, in, in Ezekiel 28, oh Tyre, you know, you were in the garden of God. Remember that? How, you remember that? And, and he uses that city and that king as a picture of Lucifer because Tyre was so resplendent. But they're going to get, their, they got their clock, you know, clean. They were used to be called the queen of the ocean. And, uh, and they just got wiped out by Alexander. Now guess how long they're going to have to be punished? Boy, oh boy, this Bible is incredible. First of all, do you realize, I mean, let, again, I went to five years of Bible college, right? I mean, I, I'm, I'm frustrated with the education I didn't get. And, uh, and, and because half of these schools are always spending their time cursing in Ruckman's name, and their graduates couldn't, you know, preach their, teach their way out of the Bible if their life depended on it. So I get irritated seeing all this all the time. But I never heard one time in Howells Anderson College as a student why the Jews went to captivity for 70 years. Now, your pastor may or may not have taught you this yet. Guess what? He can't teach you the whole Bible in a short period of time. That's why a wise pastor brings in, you know, unusual people that can give you something strange and different. You all remember the sabbatical year? Every seven years, the Jews had to let their land stay dormant. What's the word? Fertile? Or you, and he, you farmers? I don't know what the term is. Isn't it have a term when you don't? Fallow. Fallow. Yeah. What did I say? Fertile. Fertile. Same thing. <laughs> and uh, you know what they call the Interstate 95 from New York to Miami, that stretch? I, I, mean, I don't even know what that is. You know, it goes all the way from Maine all the way down to Miami. The New York-Miami stretch, you know what they call that? That's the uh, Jewish Passover. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Man, I'm running out of jokes, preacher. Amen, <laughs> Brother Grady. I'll be on Hungarian jokes pretty soon. Amen. Well, you guess what? They didn't give a flip about obeying God. And guess how many years they went before they, God came to collect? 490 years. God said, hmm, you owe me 70 years. I'm tired of waiting on you. Just because God doesn't slap you upside the head when you're doing wrong doesn't mean you're going to get off the hook. He's just giving you mercy. But pretty soon that choke chain reaches its My spirit shall not always strive with man. And so those Jews went to captivity to pay him off. That land, that land rested 70 years. <laughs> he got the 70 years, neighbor. Well, guess what? Take a wild guess what God's going to do to Tyre. Those Jews are going off into captivity for 70 years, and these, these nasty Tyre, Tyre people are mocking them. So God says, what are you laughing about? Those are my people. I'll spank them when I'm going to spank them. You want to see what I'm going to do to you? <laughs> Look over here at Isaiah uh, 23, verse 17. Verse 15. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten... What? Isn't that beautiful? Remember I told you, I just wanted to lift the Bible up tonight. It's not really a revival type spirit tonight preaching to you much. Not, not much of an invitation that I can think of. This is more of a heavy Bible study that it will have everything to do with this nonsense of critical race theory when I'm done. This is, a, this is all coming together if you stay with me. You all see that? They're going to be forgotten 70 years. According to the days of one king after the end of 70 years, shall Tyre sing as a harlot. He says, after 70 years is up, you're going to get to go back to singing like the whore that you've always been. Keep reading, neighbor. Take in heart. Go about the city, thou harlot, thou, that has been forgotten. In other words, they're forgotten since the city was destroyed. No more making money. They were the major commercial trading uh, 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 port of the whole Phoenician you know, era there. Watch it. Sing many songs that thou mayest be remembered. Now watch, verse 17, and it shall come to pass after the end of, that's the third time God shows you 70 years. Isn't that interesting, preacher? They're going to be tied up just as long as those Jews are in captivity. That the Lord will visit Tyre, and she shall turn to her hire, and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. Should you go back to being a whore with world commerce, making money, 
they don't, no, nobody there believed in God. Just, God just shut them down for 70 years. And then, but later on in Ezekiel 26, he prophesies that one day you'll, you'll never be rebuilt again. Ultimately, Tyre is going to be totally wiped out. It didn't happen even with Alexander the Great. He burned down half the city. But after that, many more waves keep coming. Arabs showed up there in the 600s, burned the whole city to the ground. Muslims in the 12th century came in and devastated the place. Um, several folks come in and wipe it out over the centuries, you know. Then I mentioned there's this gigantic earthquake hits in 18-something. I got all the exact data in the, my new book. I'm just going quick from memory. And now, anybody that shows up in Tyre has the same two impressions, they say. Number one, they can still see in the shallow water where the island fortress is, they can see stone everywhere, pillars everywhere, everything that belonged there thrown into the ocean. And the top surface of that little 40-acre place is absolutely good for nothing, they said. These are what tourists say. And it's only used today, or as recently as just years ago, for one reason, spreading out fishermen's nets. It's sitting right there in Ezekiel 26, those very words. You know, when God said he's going to do something, he's going to do it. But all that to say this now, we're moving out here. When Alexander the Great is building those siege towers and building that mole, he sends emissaries down south to Jerusalem, not real far distance. What is, it, what is he sending them down there for? He's wanting money and provisions. Now, by the way, right now, the Persian Empire is in control of the world. Darius III. And Alexander has invaded Asia, and he's wanting to take on Darius III. He's working on it now. This port city of Tyre was a key city for, for, for uh, you know, the Persian navy. And so he wants, he wants some, some money and some manpower from and provisions from, from the Jews in Jerusalem. Well, he gets an answer back that shocks the fire at him because he's not used to getting rebuffed. The answer preacher in so many words was, no way, Jose. And it came from the ruling authority of the day who was the high priest. Want to see who he was? Turn in your Bibles in Nehemiah 12. Nehemiah 12. Guy's got a wild name. Show you in just a second. Nehemiah 12. Look down here at verse number 22. Nehemiah 12, 22. The Levites in the days of Elisha, Jordan, and Johan, and look at that next name, Jadua. You all see that? Were recorded chief of the fathers. Now he's going to go on, Jehuda will go on to be the high priest. Very young age. Also the priest to the reign of Darius the Persian. You all see that? Now see that dude, J J Jadua? So he's the high priest there when Alexander sends a messenger down. Jehuda sends an answer back, I'm sorry, we can't help you. We've already signed a non-aggression pact with Darius, and we can't help any of his enemies, or he'll get mad at us. It's like those old crazy gangster movies, Jimmy Cagney, you know. Hey, you got to buy your beer from us. I, 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 I've been buying it from him. He said he's going to beat me up if I don't buy the beer from him. Well, I'm going to beat you up if you don't buy it from me. We've all seen them old crazy gangster movies. That's what the deal was there. So Alexander the Great basically says, okay, I'll see you in a little while. I'm coming down. When I get done with these bums up here, I'm going down to clean the clocks of the, of the folks at Gaza and down in Egypt, and I'll be coming on right on through Jerusalem and make a stopover visit there. He wasn't used to being told no. And so when he finishes up the Battle of Tyre, finishes crucifying everybody on the shoreline, he marches his army down into Jerusalem. Now here's the coolest thing I can tell you, okay? Everything I'm telling you right now 
is recorded by a Jewish historian that most of you have heard of. His name is Josephus. He was a general in the Jewish army and he defected over to the Romans. You know, he's a kiss up. He's a turncoat to the Jews, you know, like, like Herod the Great was, half Jew. But he's, he, he wrote a 20 volume set of history books in 96 AD called the Antiquities of the Jews, you know. And, and the liberals love to use him for their information because he's a pretty accurate historian. But when it comes to covering what I'm about to tell you now, all the liberal historians want to dismiss it because it ties into the Word of God and the Lord. But other times they don't have a problem with it. You know what he says? I got all the exact quotes coming up in my new book. You can pull them up on the internet if you look it up. He says the night before Alexander showed up, and he's talking about something, when Josephus is writing this, he's talking about what took place 400 years earlier, 430 years earlier to be exact. So sometimes there's holes in these stories and there's, there, there's uh, deficiencies and sometimes contradictions, you know, but that's all you get with ancient writing and ancient historians, right? They didn't have computers and emails and everything else, cell phones. But the gist of what he says is this, that according to that strong Jewish legend about what happened with this priest, that he said the day before Alexander showed up, he, the priest, Jadius, had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord, you know, appeared to him or spoke to him. And, ba and this is not scripture, you see. This is just strong tradition off the top historian of the day who has no interest in God. For him to write any of this, there's no motive for him to write it. This is exactly what he understood to be the case first century A.D. He said, in the dream, the Lord said to the Jadius, I got this. <laughs> Don't get nervous. Relax. Open the gates of the city tomorrow when Alexander shows up. And then march on out there with all your high priestly regalia and all your attendants and go out and meet the old guy. And I'll take care of everything else. Well, he's, he's not as nervous now. Next day, here comes Alexander the Great approaching Jerusalem with his army of 30, 40,000 Macedonians. And out comes the high priest all decked out. The key was his mitre, boy. It has the name of Jehovah on that plate, that gold plate. When Alexander the Great sees him coming out ahead of everybody, he falls down on the ground just about. Worships. Matter of fact, one of his generals flipped out. According to Josephus, got the general's name even. He said, King, my king, what are you doing? You're the ruler of the world. To be anyway, what are you doing worshiping a Jew? And Alexander, according to Josephus, rebukes him. Not rebukes him, corrects him. Said, I'm not worshiping Jadius. I'm worshiping the God that made him high priest. Now, I'm no idiot when I write. I don't just like to be cutesy. I don't take stuff off the internet. Peter Jennings used to say, if you hear a rumor your mother loves you, check it out. I live with footnotes and documentation. When I, I just, that's how I am. And Alexander the Great worshipped many gods. And the reason he held the empires he conquered together was he'd worship the gods of the local people. So for him to do something like this isn't necessarily, you know, something unusual. But I bet you a quarter there's more Holy Spirit conviction power when he's dealing with the true God of the world. He doesn't know who's who yet. He's been, pray, play, he's been praying to Hercules and Zeus and all these other meatballs for years and hadn't got any peace from it. He's won some battles. You know what happens next? According to Josephus, Alexander tells the high priest, he said, you know, I had a dream of my own three years ago back in Macedonia. And you appeared to me in my dream with that same mitre on your head. That's why I got shook up. And he said, as a matter of fact, I initiated my invasion into Asia because you told me to do it, or encouraged me to do it. Your God and you, however it worked out. Now, who knows? I'm, but everything happened exactly like Josephus is recording. It went down there in his understanding 400 years after it took place. We're 2,000 years past that now. And then, according to Josephus, arm in arm, Alexander the Great and the Jewish high priest went into the temple. 
to sacrifice to Jehovah. And of course, Alexander wouldn't have done that. The high priest did it. I don't know where they went. You know, there's no Shekinah, no God's presence in there in that post-exilic temple, second temple. But boy, it's, it's, that's all they got. And you read about Nazareth. The old men wept and the young men shouted. You've read the verses. It's there. That's their temple now. And in they go to worship the God of Israel. But, Jehu, but, but Jadius was just setting them up. You know, a left and then a knockout right. He laid the knockout right on them when, Nebuchadnezzar, when, when Alexander, look, was just about had his mind just about blown by this time, right? You know what he did? He pulled out a scroll from the temple, according to Josephus, of the book of, he, of, the book of Daniel. And he said, Mr. Alexander, before you leave town, I want to show you one more thing. You saw a dream three years ago. Let me show you what's in our book for 200 years. Would you like to see? Would you like to see yourself in the pages of our holy book. Open your Bible to Daniel chapter 2. Um, cha Daniel 8, I'll show you exactly what Nebuchadnezzar, pardon me, exactly what uh, Jadua showed Alexander the Great. Ezekiel 26. Uh, oh, what am I doing? How many can tell I'm starting to wear down? Where do you see me in um, three weeks? I'll be speaking in tongues. I don't even believe in speaking in tongues. I'm serious. I don't make this many mistakes normally. Are you kidding me, neighbor? I mean, you're a little, little up here. It's all right. That, yeah, listen, I got, where's that? I got lost last night coming up back from your house. I did. I got muchly lost, like the black preacher would say. I didn't know where I was. Serious. All right. Uh, how many of you know what an idiot servant is? That's a guy that can do one thing pretty good and nothing else. That's me. Do you know the man that invented the most controversial weapon in the history of the world? The neutron bomb? 3,000 ISIS fighters in that neighborhood. Throw one, one neutron bomb there, they're all dead in three hours. Not one broken plate of glass. The guy that invented that bomb called my house. You know what called my house means in the Greek? Called my house once a week. For seven years, every, if I'm lying, may the Lord smack the preacher right in the head in front of everybody. I wouldn't make that up to you. Just to chat about nothing. We would like phone pals and a half. And I can't even figure out how to use my... Listen, what, listen, listen, that cheese you gave me to, yesterday in that basket, I couldn't get the thing open. <laughs> I don't mind confessing. Confess your faults one to another. A oh, stinking thing of cheese with little squares in it. I couldn't figure out how to open that thing for 10 minutes. Then the Lord said, hey, stupid, look at that little string, that little plastic thing. Oh, oh I invented it and opened it up. And the guy that invented the neutron bomb wanted to talk to me for seven years. <laughs> Somebody explain that. Oh, I, did I tell you worked on the atom bomb in 43 first, then the neutron bomb. God opened up a good door and we witnessed, I witnessed him for, for years. We had a good, warm relationship. But, but, I'm an idiot servant. Now, where, what, what did I have to do where, I don't know where I was, no clue where, you say, Brother Grady, do you ever feel embarrassed when you lose track of where you were? Not when 100 people collectively can't tell me where I just was. Okay, now here, here you go, look. Daniel 8, this is what he showed, here's what he showed Alexander. So Daniel's there and he has a vision while he's in captivity, verse 3. Then I lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, there stood before the river a ram which had two horns. I mean, you got a ram truck, you know, you got the logo. These, this, this, this ram was not like the one on your truck because one horn was bigger than the other, not equal ram horns. Look at here. And uh, it had two horns, and the two horns were high, but one was higher than the other. And the higher came up last. I saw the ram. Now watch what, you tell me where that ram is coming from. You all know what uh, process of elimination means? There's three directions mentioned here. The ram was pushing westward and northward and southward, see? Where, where's that ram coming from? Somebody help me. Coming from the east. So that no beast might stand before him. Neither was there any that could deliver out of his hand, but he did according to his will and became great. Now, you may or may, probably most of you know this, that's talking about the Medo-Persian
Persian Empire of Darius III. The Media Empire, small one, and the big Persian Empire merged together, one horn bigger than the other one. Stay with me, neighbor. It's going to get wild in a minute. Verse 5, And as I was considering, behold, an he-goat came from where? <laughs> here comes another animal. And there's no process of elimination needed to be figured out here. Holy Ghost tells you exactly which way that goat's coming from. Uh, hello, neighbor. He's coming from the west. Can I get a witness on that? You might say he's coming from the land of Japheth. You all see this? This is what critical race theory really boils down to, an attack on your Bible. And we're too dumb to realize it most of the time. Watch it. And as I was considering, behold, and he gold came from the west on the face of the whole earth. See that phrase right there? Do you know Alexander the Great conquered what was considered to be 90% of the known world in his day? And he did it in 13 years with a 3,000-mile front from Greece past Afghanistan to India? Oh, not I say, how much land? Nothing much. Two million square miles, 13 years. You want to know how, you know, you want to know how the Bible shows it to you? How many remember uh, Wile E. Coyote and the Roadrunner? Let me see some spiritual people here. You remember the Roadrunner's legs when he's running? They're spinning like wheels on fire. Remember that? Look at the rest of the verse. And it, on the whole earth, comma, and touch not the ground. Boom, he's moving out. You see him coming from the west. That's Alexander the Great. And he had a notable horn between his eyes, one horn. Verse 6, and he came to the ram that had two horns, which I had seen standing before the river. Don't miss it. And ran unto him. In the fury of his power. You see that thing? He's pursuing Darius the third. Put your seatbelt on. The next verse is one of the most important verses in the Word of God. It's the first time Genesis 9:27 is ever fulfilled. Look at it very carefully. And I saw him come close. First he ran to the ram, and then he came to the, first he came to the ram in verse 6, then he ran unto him in verse 6, and now he's coming close to him. And I saw him come close unto the ram, and he was moved with cholera against him, and smote the ram, and brake his two horns, and there was no power in the ram to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground, and stamped upon him, and there was none that could deliver the ram out of his hand. You know what that is right there, neighbor? That's the battle of guacamole. <laughs> what kind of a crazy thing are you telling us? I don't know, neighbor. I don't know. Three months ago, I was preaching this someplace. I don't even know what planet I was on. But I was covering this material, and I was just a little tired that night. And I said, the, it was the battle of guacamole. And I wasn't even thinking of what I said. The, the brethren have yet to let me live it down. It's the battle of Gargamela. October... One, 330 B.C., Alexander is bearing down northern Iraq, not far from Mosul, present-day Mosul, bearing down on that battle. He's literally chasing Darius III off the field with his chariot. Darius is running for his life, and Alexander is closing in and going to kill him. And at the last minute, he gets a messenger that his whole left flank is being threatened. And now he's got to decide, kill him and get the glory and end everything, or save my army's flank. Ah, you cockroach, he puts it off and lets him go. He was right on him, just like those verses are telling you. Go read the battle yourself, just gargle it. <laughs> Google it. And he chases, and he, he goes back and he saves his army, and then he goes back the next day looking for the right. Whole, whole Persian army's wiped out. Next day, Darius is killed by a disloyal assassin from his own people. That's the verses of the section of Scripture that was shown to Daniel, I mean Alexander. But watch, it wasn't just a get out of free jail, uh, uh, get out of jail free card that uh, Jadius the high priest was using 
with Alexander, you know, and it's telling him, this means, this is you, right? He, would have, he didn't have to do that. All he had to do was take uh, Alexander. Now let's look, look across the page. Picture him with this gigantic scroll with all those Hebrew characters, and he just takes him right across the page so there's no doubt in what's going on. Look at verse 21. Verse 20. The ram which thou sawest, having two horns, are the kings of Media and Persia. And the rough goat is the king of Grecia, and the great horn that is between his eyes is the first king. And Alexander the Great's eyes popped open. And you know what I did? I wrote down exactly what Josephus said happened next. Here's the direct quote. I've just been paraphrasing. Here's his own words. And when the book of Daniel was showed him, wherein Daniel declared that one of the Greeks should destroy the empire of the Persians. He supposed that himself was the person intended. And as, and as he was glad, then glad, he dismissed the multitude for the present. He marched out of there, preacher, giving, them, giving those Jews all kinds of perks and privileges and all. He's just talking to himself. When he walked out of that temple and he had that battle of Gargamela the, basically the next year and did exactly what the scripture was showed to him what happened. Don't you think he's talking to himself again by now? Hercules and them dudes couldn't help him, Apollo. But that God of Jadi and man alive, I saw that dream and then I saw the scripture and I experienced the thing. And isn't that exactly what chapter 2 says, which, which they would have showed Alexander that as well. It probably started there chronologically when Nebuchadnezzar had that vision, remember? The golden head and the silver arm, remember that? Daniel said, four empires are coming. The first one's already here, Nebi, that's you. And after you, though, an inferior kingdom's coming up with two arms of silver, Media, Persia. But then they're going to be replaced by another one, brass, thighs, and belly. Who's that? Greece. See, neighbor? Look. Shem, Asia. Shem, Asia. Japheth, Europe. And who knocks off the, uh, who knocks off the Greeks? Look at here. Verse, th verse 8. Therefore, the he-goat waxed very great, Alexander the what? Great. And when he was strong, the great. See how God giving you those buzzwords, man? The great horn was broken. And he dies at 32. Suddenly, they don't know whether he's typhus, poison, uh, malaria. They don't know what happened. He just died in the palace of Babylon. Died exactly where Nebuchadnezzar died at 80 years of age. Look what happens after his horn gets broken. They asked him on his deathbed, who gets the empire? You haven't left an heir. He said, give it to the strongest. And then left for eternity. Well, guess what happened to him? The Bible told you 200 years ahead of time what happened. For, and for, verse 8, and for it, in its place in other words, came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. Hello, neighbor, across the page. Verse 22, now that being broken, whereas four stood up for it, four kingdoms shall stand up out of the nation, but not in this power. Go to any secular encyclopedia, go home and on your phone and look it up on your phone and see if Alexander the Great's empire wasn't subsequently divided up among his top four generals. Exactly like God said it would happen. Well, they can't hold the thing together very long. And so by, you know, 150 or so, 100 B.C., I, I don't have the dates down yet. Guess who knocks off the brass belly? What's left, what's left of Alexander's brass belly and thighs? Those two iron legs. Who's the two iron legs? That's the Roman Empire, the fourth one. Is Rome in Asia, <laughs> Africa? I'll let you figure this one out on your own, or Europe. Where, where, where's Rome? Asia, Africa, Europe. <laughs> oh, very good. I'm so proud of you.
And then the Ten Toes, that's the revived Roman Empire in our day. When, at, when, when listen, when, when, when Alexander the Great knocks off Darius, and then the Romans come after him, the white man has never looked back again. He's, he is now enlarged and will be enlarged to the end. He's enlarged right now. Worldly as the devil. We've had our big, and tomorrow night, I'll tell you, neighbor, if you can possibly make it tomorrow night, we're going to have the, probably the best message of the week, I mean, in a good way. The thing that got me most excited. But I'm going to close right now with one picture of something, and then we're out of here. I just want you to see that JPEth has been enlarged now. Now, watch this, neighbor. By the way, Alexander the Great, there's, there's, there is a tradition about him that cannot be, a preacher, it can't be uh, documented. It can't be documented. And I, therefore, I, he, I hesitate to use it, you know? But I throw it into my book because it, it never goes out of existence. Everybody keeps circulating this story. And they can't nail it down with any historical confirmation. And the reason I think that it stays, stays uh, popular is because it sounds exactly like something a burned out 32 year old king would have said. It has to do with his last will when he's going to be, he's going to get ready to expire. His last instructions to his generals. Again, I can't confirm this, but you know, didn't Elvis Presley sing a song, If I Can Dream? Forget about John Lennon. Imagine Elvis. I like Elvis' version. If I can dream of a better world. Thinking positive, amen? This is what this universal tradition says. It came from someplace. Preacher's last three commissions, last three orders to his generals. Number one, he said, I want my casket carried just by my physicians, nobody else. Because I want everybody to know that doctors can't heal anything when Bush comes to show. He said, number two, I want my gold coins and silver coins strewn in the path of my casket. You know, behind him, maybe in front of him, flower petals at a wedding, all my gold coins and silver coins, to show you that money don't mean anything when it comes to the end. I don't know if this is true or not, but it sure sounds like something a burned out king would have said, watch my lips, especially one that had a lot of connections. How much Holy Ghost conviction do you think he felt when he walked into that true temple and he looked at the Word of God? You don't think the Word of God has convicting power? And then the very thing that happens, happened? I mean, it, it reads like a wild story. Who knows how true it is? But his third request was, and when I'm being carried in my coffin, I want my arms hanging out of the, ca the casket where my hands can be visible. Imagine a coffin being carried with two holes in it. They wanted, he said, I want everybody to see my hands. What did Paul say? Can't take anything with you, neighbor. You, you didn't come in with anything. You're not going out with anything. Ain't that interesting? Now, here's where I'll quit. I'll show you the coolest thing I think I have on paper. When I say that, I mean things God showed me that inspire me, right? You want to see the coolest thing in the whole world right now? We'll go home with this. Let's fast forward 400 years. Well, about the time Josephus was writing all these stories down, the Apostle Paul had come and gone already. Turn to Acts 16 and we'll quit right here. Acts 16. When you get to Acts chapter 16... The Roman Empire is in charge, right? We've gone from the brass to the iron. Japheth is firmly entrenched, right, in the world. And uh, he's never going to look back again, right? But now here's the thing. Japheth is a, is a materialistic pagan world. That Roman Empire is as bad as you could get, right? God's going to have to, first he has now, he has now enlarged Japheth Physically, right? Well, now he's going to have to enlarge Japheth spiritually. He's going to have to infuse the gospel into Europe, okay? Now, this, this, is, this is as good as it's going to get here. Now, look at verse number 6. Now, when they had gone... Now, where are they? They're, Paul is At verse 6, Paul is on his third missionary journey. Do you know where he is? This is very important. Right due north of Israel, right... Uh, kind of above Lebanon, their tire. When you go way up there, you get into Turkey. I think you know where, on your map, right? If you go straight up north, if you, then it kind of tur cur curves off to the left, the big chunk of land out there. All of that is Turkey. I think most of you know that. 
And, and that's what we'd call Asia Minor. That's where the seven churches of uh, Asia are. Preacher's not his head. He's taught you a lot of that probably, okay? That's where Paul is running around right now. Okay? Watch this, neighbor. Verse 6. Now, when they had gone throughout Pergia and the region of Galatia, that's where your book of Galatians comes from, and look at this hate, look at his hate crime. Hate, hate, hate. And we're forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. God is a racist. God, he said, no more preaching to Chinese Asian people. No. What is it? Can't you read? Doesn't that look like hate? But according to the nuts out there in the world tonight that are chasing you down and trying to make you nervous? Now, because Paul is a Baptist, he's thick-headed, God's going to have to tell him again because he don't get it the first time. Verse 7, After they were come to Messiah, they essayed to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit suffered them out again. Look at that thing, neighbor. You want to know what it says in the Greek? I'm just being funny by saying it that way. You know what it says in the Greek? They were called Christians first where? Antioch, Asia. You know what God says? They've got enough preaching up in Asia now. Ready? It's time to hang a left. We're going to go after the Polacks now. <laughs> Literally. Do you understand? What I'm making it so simple. And if you only knew how much I believe the silly way I'm putting it, that's exactly what he's getting ready to do. He's going to go after your relatives. How many of you have Chinese relatives, Asian relatives? You know what I mean, neighbor? I think you all come from Europe, don't you? Well, you better thank God he made a left turn here. He's coming after the Europeans. He's coming after Japheth because he's going to enlarge Japheth spiritually now so that he can accomplish the mission he set out for to get the gospel to as much of the world as he could. Verse 8, And they passing by Messiah, watch it, came down to Troas. You all see that? They come down from the high ground, high country, and they have now reached, this is so cool, they have now reached the edge of Asia. They're on the shore right there of the northwest side of Turkey. And guess what's in front of them? A big body of water right there. In Bible days, it was called the Aegean Sea. It may, may still be that now. Aegean Sea. Guess what's on the other side, on the other side of the sea? Europe! The land of the white people. See? See, every time I say that, it makes somebody nervous. See, you see? That's, that's the conditioning we've all been messed with. That's your ancestors over there that God is interested in. And they're going to be the top dogs for the good of the whole world. And I don't care what crazy Black Lives Matter crowd says, it, God still did it, and he's not going to take a baby aspirin over anybody's problem with anything. So watch this, neighbor. They came down to Troas. Now, here we go, neighbor, verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of, out of all the places in Europe, preacher, look where it comes from. It comes from Macedonia. <laughs> Alexander the Great, what was his father's name? King Philip of Macedon. Alexander the Great wasn't even a Greek. He was a Macedonian. They were like the radical neighbors of the Greeks. And when his father got assassinated, Philip the Great, Alexander at 20 years of age, organized Macedonians and Greeks and put them all together. Made the Corinthian League to come after crazy Darius III. After maybe seeing a vision in his brain from God himself. Ah, the Bible's so boring. I, I can't get anything out of it. We, and, and, and after he had seen the vision, oh, pardon me, verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Who's us? Europeans, Japhethites. Can I tell you something, sweet neighbor? I hope you married men have good wives. The ones I've seen seem very good. Some of the husbands look pretty heart hurting, but the wives all seem like nice ladies, spiritual people. I, I married up, man. My wife gave me my first Bible for a wedding gift. I got a good woman. Prayed for me to get saved. Listen, she's working on my book right now. But you know what? We were in the Smoky Mountains. Hello, neighbor. 2005, I just got back from preaching to Dr. Ruckman's blowout for the fourth time. My How Satan Turned America Against God book had just come out that year. I'm living in the smoke, living the life on nine acres on House Mountain in Corrington, Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee. 
enjoying myself, two German shepherds running around loose in the yard every night, drinking my sweet tea, amen, Brother Grady. Living the life that all the New York State people, I want to get out of here. I remember how it used to be. <laughs> and guess what? I had some folks in Michigan wanted me to come up there and start a church. I'm not even going to tell you 2% of the story. It's too long. But two couples were trying to get me to go up there to start a church in nasty Flint, Michigan. Anybody ever heard of that nasty place? You can hear gunshots outside the window any given night. Are you ready, neighbor? And I hadn't had any confirmation to go. But then all of a sudden, preacher, one of those two couples, one of the wives pulled a fast one and sent me an email. I came home from something, sat down on my couch in Tennessee, and my wife said, honey, we just got an email. I haven't even read it yet. It's for you anyway. She hands me the email and sits down on our couch, and I'm sitting on this couch. Are you ready, neighbor? My German shepherd named Pete after Dr. Ruckman. I named him Pete. Sitting on the floor. I'm in, I'm in hog heaven. Smoky Mountains. I look at the email. You know what it says? It says, Dear Brother Grady, it's from a wife of one of those two couples, right? She said, you know, we're praying about you coming here to start a church. And then she said, doesn't the Bible say something about come over and help us? When I read that, look, the Holy Ghost stabbed me like nobody, like Alexander the Great would have stabbed somebody. Boom. Now, let me tell you the kind of wife I have, ready? Right? I hope you got a wife like this. I'm sure most of you do. If you ladies aren't quite there yet, just get with the program. Ready? When I read that, I didn't turn to my wife and say, honey, look at this. Maybe we better start kicking in some prayers about this. Well, look at here. Oh, boy. We got to think about that, right? Nothing like that. Here's my exact words. Ready? I said, honey, she, she, you know, she read it with me. I said, honey, why don't we call it Macedonia Baptist Church? What do you think? Just like that. And she gave up her home on nine acres in the Smoky Mountains. Just like that. And we were up there, I don't know, a month. Sewer water and all. Okay, neighbor, here it comes. I spent nine years up there. Here it comes. Here it comes. Uh, I need a, I need a um, guinea pig. Who's a good guinea pig to pick on? I'm, go I'm done with this. I just need a guinea pig. Who's a good guinea pig? Somebody nominate a guinea pig. I'm going to set him up. All he's got to do is be able to read English. Who? Somebody? Him. Okay. Yeah, that's it. The guy with the beard. His wife just, no, don't look behind you. The wife just elbowed him. Say amen right there. Hey, come on up here. Come on down. <laughs> Isn't this terrible? Anybody ever been in a black church before? Brother Grady's a racist. I've preached in like 20,000 black churches over the years, right? And it's really funny. The preachers start preaching. They get somebody to read the scriptures for them, and then they keep cutting in to make a comment and then let them keep on a reading, right? Remember that? Oh, listen. By the way, I want you to know what a racist Brother Grady is. Brother Grady has an all-black King James Bible pro-Ruckman church in West Memphis, Arkansas that supports me monthly <laughs> because I'm a racist. But I'll tell you something funnier than that. There's a guy in his church named Brother Dudley nicest black dude you ever saw in your life. First time I ever met him, he had his, his wild looking watch on his arm. I said, where'd you get that, Brother Dudley? He was on my arm in like 30 seconds. On my wrist, he gave it to me. Nice old guy. Let it, he thinks I walk on water. Let his, wife to, uh, let his daughter to the Lord. Teenage daughter prayed his other teenage daughter through a serious heart surgery. They just loved me to death in that church. Last time I preached there, Pastor, last year, preacher told me his annual conference, Brother Tory Carter is his name, big old ex-gangbanger from Omaha, Nebraska. He thinks Dr. Ruckman walks on water, rightly dividing black church, nothing like it. He told me, he said, uh, I told him, I said, Brother, Co Brother Tory, uh, I don't want you to put me in a not that nice motel this year. I want to stay at Brother Dudley's house. Would that be all right? His exact words were, if I tell him that, he's going to get all shook up. He's going to think it's the Holy Ghost coming in there. Exact quote. First time I ever preached for that preacher, Pastor. He gave me a big old love offering and a 12-gauge shotgun to get out of the neighborhood with. <laughs> I, 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 shot, I chopped the barrel down you know, right before the election, 18 inches. I'm serious as a heart attack. 
So I told that I told that that pastor. I said, "Well, you go tell Brother Dudley to deal with it. I'm going to stay at his house." How <laughs> Zacchaeus? I got to come to your house today. You ready, neighbor? A week later, before the conference, I get a text message from Brother Dudley. Brother Grady, what kind of uh, what's your favorite color? Do you think a real man is going to have a favorite color? Any real man in here? If you have a favorite color, you're not a real man. You probably like golf and you probably like cats. Hey, Amen, right there. I'm trying to, and if you don't like John Wayne, you're probably a sorry, stinking communist. I'm serious. America's gone. When John Wayne died, you know what Maureen O'Hara said? America died when he died. Now they're trying to get rid of his name on his airport. The woke, wokeaholics. Amen. I, I, said, I said, what's my favorite color? I said, you mean beside white? What do you mean what's my favorite color? I said, okay, I made up a color. I said, blue. I got, an e I got a text message the next day. Brother Grady, what's your favorite soap? Ah, oh, that was easy. Irish Spring. You know, Grady, duh. What, what, a Polish Spring, Irish Spring. I sent that to him as an answer. You know, a week later, I showed up at that conference. After the first night was over, I followed him back to his crib, find, get my little room in there. And when I was done, he gave me his key for the next morning to come and go through the week. He's working do, or doing different things, yes? When the week was over, now don't forget the moral of the story, Brother Grady's a racist. When the week was up, I'm in the parking lot, we're all hugging it out. Another thing I don't think is really toxic masculinity, but you know, you do a little bit of it sometimes. I'm hugging it out with these dudes. And then I took the key and I said to Brother Dudley, as I handed it to him, I said, now I want you to hold my room for next, are you still here? I am. I want you to hold my, <laughs> I want you to hold my, my, my room till next year now, right? Right? You know what old Brother Dudley said? Remember, what did I tell you 10 times? Brother Grady's a racist, remember? He says, no, Brother Grady, you keep it. You may be coming through this part of the country any number of times, and I not, may not be here. You got a place to crash anytime you want it. I don't know how many racists got the key to a black man's home in West Memphis, Arkansas, but I have one right here. Don't let those politically correct, filthy animals pressure you into denying the Word of God. Stand up and be like a Christian man and defend that book. And by the way, here's my black church re Bible reader. Ready? Turn to Ezekiel, uh, Acts 16, and we're done with this. Ezekiel 16. How many, how many of you realize I have lots of we're, we're done and this is the key to the sermon? How many of you notice that? Okay. By the time you get, figure it all out, the week's already up. It was, hey, kept you alive though. I had the oxygen, amen. All right, here it comes now. Act impressed and we'll be out of here. All right, all right, brother, you got your Bible over there. Look at Acts 16, amen, brother. Verse number six. Uh, we read all from verse six down to verse number 10. All right, brother, one more verse to go, and we're going home. Hey, don't forget this. What's the goal for JPEF's enlargement? To move out, ultimately to get to England, to get this King James Bible, and then to get it over to America, and boom, the world's going to be transformed forever. Is that, is that right? Hey, anybody want to go home? Do you know what time it is? You, you can't tell the time without going to England. Greenwich Mean Time, you don't even know where you are without going to England. Longitude and latitude set in England. Greenwich, you don't know what the temperature is without BTUs. That don't stand for Pollock Thermal Units. Anybody home? I think if you want the right Bible, you're going to have to get that AV 1611. You see it right here? Am I right, neighbor? Yes, That's the ultimate goal. Is that a JPET production? <laughs> it sure is. Yeah. Genesis 10-1 started the ball rolling with Gomer. Amen. Okay, here it is. I'm afraid now you're not going to get impressed. You... I'm worried. Please, will you please, where's the girl with the polka dots? Right there. I know you'll like what I'm getting ready to say. She represents all the kids around here, all cute kids. I don't know how many times I've gone into the men's room and I have to get stuck, little kids on stools. They're in there every night at the same time I go in there. Seriously, they're in both places. I'm having fun here. Can, is, is it okay if I have some fun? You don't know what it's like out there. You're spoiled out here. I'm having fun here. All right, ready, neighbor? All right, brother. You ready to read the scripture? Now, listen, read with me, and we're out of here for the fourth time. Ready? Read verse 11. Therefore, loosing. Hold it. Therefore, what's the next word? Loosing. loosing. Not Lucy. Stay with me. Loosing 
Hello, neighbor. What do you do when you get in a boat and it's tied up to the dock? What do you do with it? You loose the boat. They're, on, they're down at Troas. Troas is right on the water. They're taking off to those nut, nuts in Europe. They're loose the boat. Go ahead, brother. From Troas, we came with a straight course. Tell it! We came with a straight, what, brother? Course. Course. Hello, neighbor. Another nautical term. Anybody seeing it in the text? Where are they doing? They're crossing the Aegean Sea, neighbor. They're heading to your crazy European bar barbarian ancestors. Hey, good brother. To Samuel that's it. That, that's it. I love it. <laughs> I'm gonna, I don't normally confess, but you, this is such a fun church. I have so much liberty here. I'm going to confess a sin. Preachers, when they got a verse they got to read, when they got weird words in there they can't begin to pronounce, they pull some sucker out. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't think we'd do that? You're sinners. You're messed up. We're messed up too. Yeah. We're just not as messed up as you are. <laughs> if we were as messed up as you, we wouldn't have a job. We're messed up and not as bad as you. That's why we're up on a platform, amen. Samuel Thracia, not bad. He was close. 60%. He almost got it, amen. Ready? You know what Samothrace is? It's a Greek island halfway across. Now, here's the end. Go ahead, brother. And the next day to Neapolis. Fake out. <laughs> the next day to Neapolis. Thank you, brother. You can go back to your wife. She's so proud of you. She's passing out back there. <laughs> okay. Now, here you go, neighbor. This is it. This is my knockout punch of the night. If if you don't get impressed, I'm going to be depressed. I'm sitting in a hillbilly church in Kentucky the other day, right on the front row, sitting next to the pastor, waiting to go up to preach after the singing, the last special was done. I'm sitting there and I got my Bible open, Acts 16, a year ago, reading these very verses, and the Holy Ghost showed it to me. I never saw it in Bible college. I just saw it six months ago in crazy Kentucky. Look, I read a book the other day written in 1897. You know how deep those dudes were back then? That guy said, when you're standing on the shore and the ocean water's rushing up past your ankles, you know how the foamy water going past your ankles? That author in 1897 said, when you look down and see that foamy water around your ankles, that represents the amount of the Word of God the Holy Spirit has opened up to your understanding. He said, the rest of it's out there. That's how deep those dudes were back then before television. You never exhaust this book in a zillion years. No, never. You see that Neapolis? That means new city. When the Apostle Paul and Luke get off that boat, having just crossed that Aegean Sea, and they touch that soil, that's the first time, Pastor, the gospel of the grace of God has ever touched European soil. Yep. It's only going to be a four verses or so later when the first Japhethite is going to be saved on, J on the continent. Cornelius was the first European saved, but he was saved in Caesarea. By the way, you go, to, you go to Israel today, any rabbinic tradition will tell you all Jews believe that Joppa, the, the, the oldest seaport in the world, Haifa, a suburb of Tel Aviv, the key city of modern Israel, was founded by Japheth. That's on the internet and a million websites if you're interested. Look, and that's where Peter is called from Joppa to come down and get the first European saved. Say amen right there. But he saved in, he saved in Asia, in Caesarea. Now, the first European's going to be saved. Her name is Lydia. And she's a businesswoman. You got that? And she's in a city called Philippi, a city named after, conquered and named after Alexander's father, King Philip. Can I get a witness? But I'm done with this. Everything is built up just for this little, I'm going to show you the ultimate English nugget in the AV 1611. Forget the Hebrew and Greek. You see that? Stepping on European soil for the first time. What's the goal, England? Get that book on your lap tonight. Ready? Please, please, please act impressed. Ready? Tell me what the scripture address is at that verse. Chapter and verse, Neapolis. Chapter and verse loud. 1611. Thank you. Elvis has left the biddle. 
the Word of God, the Gospel of the Grace of God hits Europe for the very first time at Acts 16, 11. That's an English nugget that God just put in there for you to show you how cool He is. Had nothing to do with the Greek, nothing to do with the Hebrew. You don't need Jonathan Kahn's Blue Moon books <laughs> and Harbinger series. You just need an English King James Bible. So somebody, tell me if you were impressed with that. Somebody, yeah. two hands. Thank you for letting. Thank you for letting me have fun with you tonight. I only act like I told you. Get on the internet. I've got a million sermons on there. You won't see me acting this goofy in 90% of those places. Serious. I only do that when I'm around other goofy people. <laughs> We're bond. Yeah. Amen. Hey, I'm from New York City. What are you? We drove stolen cars in driver's ed class. What are you talking about? <laughs> thank you very much, Pastor. This is more of a teaching night tonight. You do whatever you feel led. But thank you for listening so well. But tomorrow night, it's going to get real. The first time I preach, the message I'm going to preach tomorrow night, for real, the Lord told me, where'd you get that stuff? That's the first thing he told me. Tomorrow night, we'll have a fun time, okay? God bless you. All right, let's all stand. And let's be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, we want to thank you for the book that you gave to us. Like Brother Grady said tonight, uh, Lord, we cannot plumb the depths of that book. And there is so much there. And uh, yet, uh, God, you, you loved us enough to give us a, a written revelation from heaven. And you not only gave it by inspiration, but you kept it by preservation. We have it in our hands tonight in our, in our King James Bible, and we thank you for that. Lord, help us to look for things ourselves that will be a blessing, be an encouragement, uh, will, be, will cause us to get excited about the things of God. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over us tonight as we go home and uh, prepare our hearts for tomorrow. Thank you for each one that's here. Pray your blessings upon them uh, this evening and give us a good time of fellowship after the service. And we'll be careful to thank you and praise you for everything that you do in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said.